Chapter One of Life of Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Life of Charles Dickens by Frank Marzial. Chapter One Education is a kind of lottery in which there are good and evil chances, and some men draw blanks and other men draw prizes. And in saying this, I do not use the word education in any restricted sense as applying exclusively to the course of study in school or college, nor certainly when I speak of prizes am I thinking of scholarships, exhibitions, fellowships. By education I mean the whole set of circumstances which go to mold a man's character during the apprentice years of his life, and I call that a prize when those circumstances have been such as to develop the man's powers to the utmost, and to fit him to do best that of which he is best capable. Looked at in this way, Charles Dickens' education, however untoward and unpromising it may often have seemed while in the process, must really be pronounced a prize of value quite inestimable. His father, John Dickens, held a clerkship in the Navy Pay Office, and was employed in the Portsmouth Dockyard when little Charles first came into the world at Landport in Portsea on February 7, 1812. Wealth can never have been one of the familiar friends of the household, nor plenty have always sat at its board. Charles had one elder sister, and six other brothers and sisters were afterwards added to the family, and with eight children and successive removals from Portsmouth to London and London to Chatham, and no more than the pay of a government clerk, footnote, 200 pounds a year without extras from 1815 to 1820, and then 350 pounds. See Childhood and Youth of Charles Dickens by Robert Langton, a very valuable monograph. End of footnote. Charles had one elder sister and six other brothers and sisters were afterwards added to the family, and with eight children and successive removals from Portsmouth to London and London to Chatham, and no more money than the pay of a government clerk, pay which not long afterwards dwindled to a pension. Even a better domestic financier than the elder Dickens might have found some difficulty in facing his liabilities. It was unquestionably into a tottering house that the child was born, and among its ruins that he was nurtured. But through all these early years I can do nothing better than take him for my guide, and walk as it were in his companionship. Perhaps no novelist ever had a keener feeling of the pathos of childhood than Dickens, or understood more fully how real and overwhelming are its sorrows. No one, too, has entered more sympathetically into its ways. And of the child and boy that he himself had once been, he was wont to think very tenderly and very often. Again and again in his writings, he reverts to the scenes and incidents and emotions of his earlier days. Sometimes he goes back to his young life directly, speaking as of himself. More often he goes back to it indirectly, placing imaginary children and boys in the position he had once occupied. Thus it is almost possible, by judiciously selecting from his works, and using such keys as we possess, to construct, as it were, a kind of autobiography. Nor, if we make due allowance for the great writer's tendency to idealize the past, and intensify its humorous and pathetic aspects, need we at all fear that the self-written story of his life should convey a false impression. He was but two years old when his father left Portsea for London, and but four when a second migration took the family to Chatham. Here we catch our first glimpse of him in his own word painting as a very queer small boy, a small boy who was sickly and delicate and could take but little part in the rougher sports of his school companions but read much, as sickly boys will, read the novels of the older novelists in a blessed little room, a kind of palace of enchantment, where Roderick Random, Peregrine Pickle, Humphrey Clinker, Tom Jones, the Vicar of Wakefield, Don Quixote, Gil Blas, and Robinson Crusoe came out, a glorious host, to keep him company. And the queer small boy had read Shakespeare's Henry IV, too, and knew all about Falstaff's robbery of the travelers at Gad's Hill, on the rising ground between Rochester and Gravesend, and all about mad Prince Henry's pranks, and what was more, he had determined that when he came to be a man, and had made his way in the world, he should own the house called Gad's Hill Place, with the old associations of its site, 
and its pleasant outlook over Rochester and over the low-lying levels by the Thames. Was that a child's dream? The man's tenacity and steadfast strength of purpose turned it into fact. The house became the home of his later life. It was there that he died. But death was a long way forward in those old Chatham days, nor, as the time slipped by, and his father's pecuniary embarrassments began to thicken and make the forward ways of life more dark and difficult, could the purchase of Gad's Hill Place have seemed much less remote. There is one of Dickens' works which was his own special favorite, the most cherished, as he tells us, among the offspring of his brain. That work is David Copperfield. Nor can there be much difficulty in discovering why it occupied such an exceptional position in his heart of hearts, for in its pages he had enshrined the deepest memories of his own childhood and youth. Like David Copperfield, he had known what it was to be a poor, neglected lad, set to rough, uncongenial work, with no more than a mechanic's surroundings and outlook, and having to fend for himself in the miry ways of the great city. Like David Copperfield, he had formed a very early acquaintance with debts and duns, and been initiated into the mysteries and sad expedients of shabby poverty. Like David Copperfield, he had been made free of the interior of a debtor's prison. Poor lad, he was not much more than ten or eleven years old when he left Chatham, with all the charms that were ever after to live so brightly in his recollection. The gay military pageantry, the swarming dockyard, the shifting sailor life, the delightful walks in the surrounding country, the enchanted room tenanted by the first fairy daydreams of his genius, the day school where the master had already formed a good opinion of his parts, giving him Goldsmith's B as a keepsake. This pleasant land he left for a dingy house in a dingy London suburb with squalor for companionship, no teaching but the teaching of the streets, and all around and above him the depressing, hideous atmosphere of debt. With what inimitable humor and pathos has he told the story of these darkest days? Substitute John Dickens for Mr. Micawber, and Mrs. Dickens for Mrs. Micawber, and make David Copperfield a son of Mr. Micawber, a kind of elder Wilkins, and let little Charles Dickens be that son, and then you will have a record, true in every essential respect, of the child's life at this period. Quote, Poor Mrs. Micawber, she said she had tried to exert herself, and so I have no doubt she had. The center of the street door was perfectly covered with a great brass plate on which was engraved Mrs. Micawber's boarding establishment for young ladies, but I never found that any young lady had ever been to school there, or that any young lady ever came or proposed to come, or that the least preparation was ever made to receive any young lady. The only visitors I ever saw or heard of were creditors. They used to come at all hours, and some of them were quite ferocious." End of quote. Even such a plate, bearing the inscription Mrs. Dickens' establishment, ornamented the door of a house in Gower Street North, where the family had hoped, by some desperate effort, to retrieve its ruined fortunes. Even so did the pupils refuse the educational advantages offered to them, though little Charles went from door to door in the neighborhood, carrying hither and thither the most alluring circulars. Even thus was the place besieged by assiduous and angry duns. And when, in the ordinary course of such sad stories, Mr. Dickens is arrested for debt and carried off to the Marshalsea prison, footnote, Mr. Langton appears to doubt whether John Dickens was not imprisoned in the King's Bench, but this seems scarcely a point on which Dickens himself can have been mistaken. End of footnote. And when, in the course of such sad stories, Mr. Dickens is arrested for debt and carried off to the Marshall Sea Prison, he moralizes over the event in precisely the same strain as Mr. Micawber, using, indeed, the very same words, and calls on his son with many tears, Quote, to take warning by the marshalsea, and to observe that if a man had twenty pounds a year and spent nineteen pounds, nineteen shillings, and sixpence, he would be happy, but that a shilling spent the other way would make him wretched. End of quote. The son was taking note of other things besides these moral apothems, and reproduced in after days with a quite marvelous detail and fidelity all the incidents of his father's incarceration. Probably, too, he was beginning, as children will, almost unconsciously to form some estimate of his father's character. And a very queer study in human nature that must have been, 
giving Dickens, when once he had mastered it, a most exceptional insight into the ways of impecuniosity. Charles Lamb, as we all remember, divided mankind into two races, the mighty race of the borrowers and the mean race of the lenders, and expatiated, with a whimsical and charming eloquence, upon the greatness of one bigod who had been as a king among those who by process of loan obtained possession of other people's money. Shift the line of division a little, so that instead of separating borrowers and lenders, it separates those who pay their debts from those who do not pay them, and then Dickens the Elder may succeed to something of Bigod's kingship. He was one of the great race of debtors, possessing especially that ideal quality of mind on which Lamb laid such stress. Imagination played the very mischief with him. He had evidently little grasp of fact, and moved in a kind of haze, through which all clear outlines would show blurred and unreal. Sometimes, most often perhaps, that haze would be irradiated with sanguine visionary hopes and expectations. Sometimes it would be fitfully darkened with all the horrors of despair. But whether in gloom or gleam, the realities of his position would be lost. He never, certainly, contracted a debt which he did not mean honorably to pay. But either he had never possessed the faculty of forming a just estimate of future possibilities, or else, through the indulgence of what may be called a vague habit of thought, he had lost the power of seeing things as they are. Thus, all his excellencies and good gifts were neutralized at this time, so far as his family were concerned, and went for practically nothing. He was, according to his son's testimony, full of industry, most conscientious in the discharge of any business, unwearying in loving patience and solicitude when those bound to him by blood or friendship were ill or in trouble, quote, as kind-hearted and generous a man as ever lived in the world, end of quote. Yet as debts accumulated and accommodation bills shed their baleful shadow on his life and duns grew many and furious, he became altogether immersed in mean money troubles and suffered the son who was to shed such luster on his name to remain for a time without the means of learning and to sink first into a little household drudge and then into a mere warehouse boy. So little Charles, aged from 11 to 12, first blacked boots and minded the younger children, and ran messages, and affected the family purchases, which can have been no pleasant task in the then state of the family credit, and made very close acquaintance with the inside of the pawnbroker's shops, and with the purchasers of second-hand books, disposing, among other things, of the little store of books he loved so well, and then, when his father was imprisoned, ran more messages hither and thither, and shed many childish tears in his father's company, the father doubtless regarding the tears as a tribute to his eloquence, though heaven knows there were other things to cry over besides his sonorous periods. After which a connection, James Lammert by name, who had lived with the family before they moved from Camden Town to Gower Street, and was a manager of a worm-eaten, rat-riddled blacking business near Old Hungerford Market, offered to employ the lad on a salary of some six shillings a week or thereabouts. The duties which commanded these high emoluments consisted of the tying up and labeling of blacking pots. At first Charles, in consideration probably of his relationship to the manager, was allowed to do his tying, clipping, and pasting in the counting house. But soon this arrangement fell through, as it naturally would, and he descended to the companionship of the other lads similarly employed in the warehouse below. They were not bad boys, and one of them, who bore the name of Bob Fagan, was very kind to the poor little better-nurtured outcast. Once in a sudden attack of illness, applying hot blacking bottles to his side with much tenderness. But of course they were rough and quite uncultured, and the sensitive, bookish, imaginative child felt that there was something uncongenial and degrading in being compelled to associate with them. Nor, though he had already sufficient strength of character to learn to do his work well, did he ever regard the work itself as anything but unsuitable and almost discreditable. Indeed, it may be doubted whether the iron of that time did not unduly rankle and fester as it entered into his soul, and whether the scar caused by the wound was altogether quite honorable. He seems to have felt, in connection with his early employment in a warehouse, a sense of shame, such as would be more fittingly associated with the commission of an unworthy act. 
that he should not have habitually referred to the subject in after life may readily be understood but why he should have kept unbroken silence about it for long years even with his wife even with so very close a friend as forrester is less clear and in the terms used when the revelation was finally made to forrester there is always i confess appeared to me to be a tone of exaggeration Quote, my whole nature he says was so penetrated with grief and humiliation that even now famous and caressed and happy i often forget in my dreams that i have a dear wife and children even that i am a man and wandered desolately back to that time of my life. End quote. And again, quote, from that hour until this, at which I write, no word of that part of my childhood, which I have now gladly brought to a close, has passed my lips to any human being. I have never, until I now impart it to this paper, in any burst of confidence with any one, my own wife not accepted, raised the curtain I then dropped. Thank God. End of quote. Great part perhaps the greatest part of dickens success as a writer came from the sympathy and power with which he showed how the lower walks of life no less than the higher are often fringed with beauty i have never been able to entirely divest myself of a slight feeling of the incongruous in reading what he wrote about the warehouse episode in his career at first when he began his daily toil at the blacking business some poor dregs of family life were left to the child his father was at the marshalsea but his mother and brothers and sisters were, to use his own words, quote, still encamped with a young servant girl from Chatham Workhouse in the two parlors in the emptied house in Gower Street North, end of quote. And there he lived with them in much hugger-mugger, merely taking his humble midday meal in nomadic fashion on his own account. Soon, however, his position became even more forlorn. The paternal creditors proved insatiable. The gypsy home in Gower Street had to be broken up. Mrs. Dickens and the children went to live at the Marshalsea. Little Charles was placed under the roof, it cannot be called under the care, of a reduced old lady dwelling in Camden Town, who must have been a clever and prophetic old lady if she anticipated that her diminutive lodger would one day give her a kind of indirect, unenviable immortality by making her figure under the name of Mrs. Pipchin in Dombey and Son. Here the boy seems to have been left almost entirely to his own devices. He spent his Sundays in the prison, and, to the best of his recollection, his lodgings at Mrs. Pipchin's were paid for. Otherwise, he found himself in childish fashion out of the six or seven weekly shillings, breakfasting on two pennyworth of bread and milk, and supping on a penny loaf and a bit of cheese, and dining hither and thither as his boy's appetite dictated, now sensibly enough on a la mode beef or a saveloy, then less sensibly on pudding and anon not dining at all, the wherewithal having been expended on some morning treat of cheap, stale pastry. But are not all those things, the lad's shifts and expedients, his sorrows and despair, his visits to the public house, where the kindly publican's wife stoops down to kiss the pathetic little face, are they not all written in David Copperfield? And if so be that I have a reader unacquainted with that peerless book, can I do better than recommend him or her to study therein the story of Dickens' life at this particular time? At last the child's solitude and sorrows seemed to have grown unbearable. His fortitude broke down. One Sunday night he appealed to his father, with many tears, on the subject, not of his employment, which he seems to have accepted at the time manfully, but of his forlornness and isolation. The father's kind, thoughtless heart was touched. A back attic was found for Charles near the Marshalsea, at Lant Street, in the borough, where Bob Sawyer, it will be remembered, afterwards invited Mr. Pickwick to that disastrous party. The boy moved into his new quarters with the same feeling of elation as if he had been entering a palace. The change naturally brought him more fully into the prison circle. He used to breakfast there every morning before going to the warehouse, and would spend the larger portion of his spare time among the inmates. Nor do Mr. Dickens and his family, and Charles, who is to us the family's most important member, appear to have been relatively at all uncomfortable while under the shadow of the Marshalsea. There is in David Copperfield a passage of inimitable humor, where Mr. Micawber, enlarging on the pleasures of imprisonment for debt, apostrophizes the King's Bench prison as being the place, quote, where, for the first time in many revolving years, 
the overwhelming pressure of pecuniary liabilities was not proclaimed from day to day by importunate voices declining to vacate the passage, where there was no knocker on the door for any creditor to appeal to, where personal service of process was not required, and detainers were lodged merely at the gate. End of quote. There's a similar passage in Little Dorrit, where the tipsy medical practitioner of the Marshalsea comforts Mr. Dorrit in his affliction by saying, quote, We are quiet here. We don't get badgered here. There's no knocker here, sir, to be hammered at by creditors and bring a man's heart into his mouth. Nobody comes here to ask if a man's at home, and to say he'll stand on the doormat till he is. Nobody writes threatening letters about money to this place. It's freedom, sir. It's freedom. End of quote. One smiles as one reads, and it adds a pathos, I think, to the smile, to find that these are records of actual experience. The Marshalsea prison was to Mr. Dickens a haven of peace, and to his household a place of plenty. Not only could he pursue his career there, untroubled by fears of arrest, but he exercised among the other gentlemen jailbirds a supremacy, a kind of kingship, such as that to which Charles Lamb referred. They recognized in him the superior spirit, ready of pen and effluent of speech, and with a certain grandeur in his conviviality. He it was who drew up their memorial to George of England on an occasion no less important than the royal birthday when they, the monarch's unfortunate subjects, so they were described in the memorial, besought the king's gracious majesty of his well-known munificence to grant them a something towards the drinking of the royal health. Ah, with what keen eyes and penetrative genius did little Charles, from his corner, watch the strange sad stream of humanity that trickled through the room, and may be said to have smeared its approval of that petition. And while Mr. Dickens was enjoying his prison honors, he was also enjoying his admiralty pension. Footnote. According to Mr. Langdon's dates, he would still be drawing his pay. End of footnote. And while Mr. Dickens was enjoying his prison honors, he was also enjoying his admiralty pension, which was not forfeited by his imprisonment. And his wife and children were consequently enjoying a larger measure of necessaries of life than had been theirs for many a month. So all went on merrily enough at the Marshalsea. But even under the old law, imprisonment for debt did not always last forever. A legacy and the Insolvent Debtors Act enabled Mr. Dickens to march out of durance, in some sort with the honors of war, after a few months' incarceration. This would be early in 1824, and he went with his family, including Charles, to lodge with the Mrs. Pipchin already mentioned. Charles, meanwhile, still toiled on in the blacking warehouse, now removed to Chandos Street, Covent Garden, and had reached such skill in the tying, pasting, and labeling of the bottles that small crowds used to collect at the window for the purpose of watching his deft fingers. There was pride in this, no doubt, but also humiliation, and release was at hand. His father and Lambert quarreled about something. About what Dickens seems never to have known, and he was sent home. Mrs. Dickens acted the part of the peacemaker on the next day, probably feeling that amid the shadowy expectations on which she and her husband had subsisted for so long, even six or seven shillings a week was something tangible and not to be despised. Yet in spite of this, he did not return to the business. His father decided that he should go to school. Quote, I do not write resentfully or angrily, said Dickens, in the confidential communication made long afterwards to Forrester, and to which reference has already been made but I never afterwards forgot, I never shall forget, I never can forget, that my mother was warm for my being sent back. Unquote. The Mothers of Great Men is a subject that has been handled often and eloquently. How many of those who have achieved distinction can trace their inherited gifts to a mother's character and their acquired gifts to a mother's teaching and influence? Mrs. Dickens seems not to have been a mother of this stamp. She scarcely, I fear, possessed those admirable qualities of mind and heart which one can clearly recognize as having borne fruit in the greatness and goodness of her famous son. So far as I can discover, she exercised no influence upon him at all. Her name hardly appears in his biographies. He never, that I can recollect, mentions her in his correspondence, only refers to her on the rarest occasions. And perhaps, on the whole, this is not to be wondered at if we accept the constant tradition that she had, unknown to herself, sat to her son for the portrait of Mrs. Nickleby, 
and suggested to him the main traits in the character of that inconsequent and not very wise old lady. Mrs. Nickleby, I take it, was not the kind of person calculated to form the mind of a boy of genius. As well might one expect some very domestic bird to teach an eaglet how to fly. The school to which our callow eaglet was sent in the spring or early summer of 1824 belonged emphatically to the old school of schools. It bore the goodly name of Wellington House Academy and was situated in Mornington Place near the Hampstead Road. A certain Mr. Jones held chief rule there and as more than fifty years have now elapsed since Dickens' connection with the establishment ceased, I trust there may be nothing libelous in giving further currency to his statement, or rather, perhaps, to his recorded impression. Footnote. See paper entitled Our School. End of footnote. I trust there may be nothing libelous in giving further currency to his statement, or rather, perhaps, to his recorded impression, that the headmaster's one qualification for his office was dexterity in use of the cane, especially as another old boy corroborates that impression, and declares Mr. Jones to have been, quote, a most ignorant fellow and a mere tyrant, unquote. Dickens, however, escaped with comparatively little beating, because he was a day boy, and sound policy dictated that day boys, who had facilities for carrying home their complaints, should be treated with some leniency. So he had to get his learning without tears, which was not at all considered the orthodox method in the good old days, and indeed I doubt if he finally took away from Wellington House Academy very much of the book knowledge that would tell in a modern competitive examination. For though in his own account of the school, it is implied that he resumed his interrupted studies with Virgil, and was before he left head boy and the possessor of many prizes, yet this is not corroborated by the evidence of his surviving fellow pupils. Nor can we, of course, in the face of their direct counter-evidence, treat statements made in a fictitious or half-fictitious narrative as if made in what professed to be a sober autobiography. Dickens, I repeat, seems to have inquired a very scant amount of classic lore while under the instruction of Mr. Jones, and not too much lore of any kind. But if he learned little, he observed much. He thoroughly mastered the humors of the place, just as he had mastered the humors of the Marshalsea. He had got to know all about the masters and all about the boys, and all about the white mice, of which there were many in various stages of civilization. He acquired, in short, a fund of school knowledge that seemed inexhaustible, and on which he drew again and again with the most excellent results, in David Copperfield, in Dombey, in such inimitable short papers as Old Cheeseman. And while thus, half unconsciously perhaps, assimilating the very life of the school, he was himself a thorough schoolboy, bright, alert, intelligent, taking part in all fun and frolic, amply indemnifying himself for his enforced abstinence from childish games during the dreary warehouse days, good at recitations and mimic plays, and already possessed of a reputation among his peers as a writer of tales. End of chapter one. Chapter 2 of Life of Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Life of Charles Dickens by Frank Marziaus. Chapter 2. Dickens cannot have been very long at Wellington House Academy, for before May 1827, he had been at another school near Brunswick Square and had also obtained and quitted some employment in the office of a solicitor in New Square, Lincoln's Inn Fields. It seems clear, therefore, that the whole of his school life might easily be computed in months, and in May 1827, it will be remembered, he was still but a lad of fifteen. At that date, he entered the office of a second solicitor, in Gray's Inn this time, on a salary of thirteen shillings and sixpence a week, afterwards increased to fifteen shillings. Here he remained till November 1828, again picking up a good deal of information that cannot perhaps be regarded as strictly legal, but such as he was afterwards able to turn to admirable account. He would seem to have studied the profession exhaustively in all its branches, from the topmost talking horns and perkers to the lowest pettifoggers like Pell and Brass, and also to have given particular attention to the parasites of the law, the guppies and chucksters, 
and altogether to have stored his mind, as he had done at school, with a series of invaluable notes and observations. All very well, no doubt, as we look at the matter now. But then it must often have seemed to the ambitious, energetic lad that he was wasting his time. Was he to remain forever a lawyer's clerk, who is not the means to be an articled clerk, and who can never, therefore, aspire to become a full-blown solicitor? Was he to spend the future obscurely in the dingy purlieus of the law? His father, in whose career something, as Mr. Micawber would have said, had at last turned up, was now a reporter for the press. The son determined to be a reporter, too. He threw himself into this new career with characteristic energy. Of course, a reporter is not made in a day. It takes many months of drudgery to obtain such skill in shorthand as shall enable the pen of the ready writer to keep up with the winged words of speech and make dots and lines that shall be readable. Dickens labored hard to acquire the art. In the intervals of his work, he made it a kind of holiday task to attend the reading room of the British Museum and so remedy the defects in the literary part of his education. But the best powers of his mind were directed to Gurney's system of shorthand, and in time he had his reward. He earned and justified the reputation of being one of the best reporters of his day. I shall not quote the autobiographical passages in David Copperfield, which bear on the difficulties of stenography. The book is in everybody's hands. But I cannot forego the pleasure of brightening my pages with Dickens' own description of his experiences as a reporter, a description contained in one of those charming, felicitous speeches of his which are almost as unique in kind as his novels. Speaking in May 1865, as chairman of a public dinner on behalf of the Newspaper Press Fund, he said, quote, I have pursued the calling of a reporter under circumstances of which many of my brethren at home in England here, many of my modern successors, can form no adequate conception. I have often transcribed for the printer, from my shorthand notes, important public speeches, in which the strictest accuracy was required, and a mistake in which would have been to a young man severely compromising, writing on the palm of my hand, by the light of a dark lantern, in a post-chaise and four, galloping through a wild country and through the dead of night, at the then surprising rate of fifteen miles an hour. The very last time I was at Exeter, I strolled into the castle yard there to identify, for the amusement of a friend, the spot on which I once took, as we used to call it, an election speech of my noble friend Lord Russell. In the midst of a lively fight maintained by all the vagabonds in that division of the county, and under such pelting rain that I remembered two good-natured colleagues who chanced to be at leisure, held a pocket handkerchief over my notebook, after the manner of a state canopy in an ecclesiastical procession. I have worn my knees by writing on them on the old back row of the old gallery in the old House of Commons and I have worn my feet by standing to write in a preposterous pen in the old house of lords, where we used to be huddled together like so many sheep, kept in waiting, say, until the woolsack might want restuffing. Returning home from excited political meetings in the country to the waiting press in London, I do verily believe I have been upset in almost every description of vehicle known in this country. I have been, in my time, belated in miry byroads, towards the small hours, forty or fifty miles from London, in a wheelless carriage, with exhausted horses and drunken postboys, and have got back in time for publication, to be received with never-forgotten compliments by the late Mr. Black, coming in the broadest of scotch from the broadest of hearts I ever knew. End of quote. What shall I add to this? That the papers on which he was engaged as a reporter were The True Sun, The Mirror of Parliament, and The Morning Chronicle that long afterwards, little more than two years before his death, when addressing the journalists of New York, he gave public expression to his, quote, grateful remembrance of a calling that was once his own, and declared, to the wholesome training of severe newspaper work when I was a very young man, I constantly refer my first success, end of quote. That his income as a reporter appears latterly to have been some five guineas a week, of course, in addition to expenses and general breakages and damages. That there is independent testimony to his exceptional quickness in reporting and transcribing, and to his intelligence in condensing. That to an observer so keen and apt, the experiences of his business journeys in those more picturesque and eventful anti-railway days must have been invaluable. 
and finally that his connection with journalism lasted far into 1836, and so did not cease till some months after Pickwick had begun to add to the world's store of merriment and laughter. But I have not really reached Pickwick yet, nor anything like it. That masterwork was not also a first work. With all Dickens' genius, he had to go through some apprenticeship in the writer's art before coming upon the public as the most popular novelist of his time. Let us go back for a little, to the twilight before the full sunrise, nay, to the earliest streak upon the grayness of night, to his first original published composition. Dickens himself, and in his preface to Pickwick, too, has told us somewhat about that first paper of his, how it was, quote, dropped stealthily one evening at twilight, with fear and trembling, into a dark letter-box in a dark office up a dark court in Fleet Street, end of quote how it was accepted and appeared in all the glory of print, and how he was so filled with pleasure and pride on purchasing a copy of the magazine in which it was published, that he went into Westminster Hall to hide the tears of joy that would come into his eyes. The paper thus joyfully wept over was originally entitled A Dinner at Poplar Walk, and now bears, among the sketches by Boz, the name of Mr. Minns and his cousin. The periodical in which it was published was the old monthly magazine, and the date of publication was January 1st, 1834. A dinner at Poplar Walk may be pronounced a very fairly told tale. It is no doubt always easy to be wise after the event, in criticism particularly easy. And when once a writer has achieved success, there is but too little difficulty in showing that his earlier productions were prophetic of his future greatness. At the risk, however, of incurring a charge of this kind, I repeat, that Dickens' first story is well told, and that the editor of the old monthly magazine showed due discernment in accepting it and encouraging his unknown contributor to further efforts. Quite apart from the fact that the author was only a young fellow of some two or three and twenty, both this first story and the stories that followed it in the old monthly magazine during 1834 and the early part of 1835 possessed qualities of a very remarkable kind. So, also, did the humorous descriptive papers shortly afterwards published in the Evening Chronicle, papers that, with the stories, now compose the book known as Sketches by Boz. Sir Arthur Helps, speaking of Dickens, just after Dickens' death. Footnote. Macmillan's Magazine, July 1870. End of footnote. Sir Arthur Helps, speaking of Dickens, just after Dickens' death, said, quote, his powers of observation were almost unrivaled. Indeed, I have said to myself, when I have been with him, he sees and observes nine facts for any two that I see and observe. End of quote. This particular faculty is, I think, almost as clearly discernible in the sketches as in the author's later and greater works. London, its sins and sorrows, its gaieties and amusements, its suburban gentilities and central squalor, the aspects of its streets, and the humours of the dingier classes among its inhabitants. All this had certainly never been so seen and described before. The power of exact, minute delineation lavished upon the picture is admirable. Again, the dialogue in the dramatic parts is natural, well-conducted, characteristic, and so used as to help, not impede, the narrative. The speech, for instance, of Mr. Bung, the broker's man, is a piece of very good Dickens. Of course there is humor, and very excellent fooling some of it is, and equally, of course, there is pathos, and some of that is not bad. Do I mean at all that this earlier work stands on the same level of excellence as the masterpieces of the writer? Clearly not. It were absurd to expect the stripling, half furtively coming forward, first without a name at all, and then under the pseudonym of Boz, footnote. It was the pet name of one of his brothers. That was why he took it. End of footnote. It were absurd to expect the stripling, half furtively coming forward, first without a name at all, and then under the pseudonym of Boz, to write with the superb, practiced ease and mastery of the Charles Dickens who penned David Copperfield. By dint of doing blacksmith's work, says the French proverb, one becomes a blacksmith. The artist, like the handicraftsman, must learn his art. Much in the sketches betrays inexperience, or perhaps it would be more just to say, comparative clumsiness of hand. The descriptions, graphic as they undoubtedly are, 
lack for the most part the final imaginative touch, the kind of inbreathing of life which afterwards gave such individual charm to Dickens' word painting. The humor is more obvious, less delicate, turns too readily on the claim of the elderly spinster to be considered young and the desire of all spinsters to get married. The pathos is often spoiled by overemphasis and declamation. It lacks simplicity. For the sketches published in the old monthly magazine, Dickens got nothing beyond the pleasure of seeing himself in print. The Chronicle treated him somewhat more liberally, and, on his application, increased his salary, giving him, in view of his original contributions, seven guineas a week instead of the five guineas which he had been drawing as a reporter. Not a particularly brilliant augmentation, perhaps, and one at which he must often have smiled in after years when his pen was dropping gold as well as ink. Still, the addition to his income was substantial, and the son of John Dickens must always, I imagine, have been in special need of money. Moreover, the circumstances of the next few months would render any increased earnings doubly pleasant, for Dickens was shortly after this engaged to be married to Miss Catherine Hogarth, the daughter of one of his fellow workers on the Chronicle. There had been, so Forster tells us, a previous very shadowy love affair in his career, an affair so visionary indeed and boyish as scarcely to be worthy of mention in this history save for three facts. First, that his devotion, dreamlike as it was, seems to have had love's highest practical effect in inducing him to throw his whole strength into the study of shorthand. Secondly, that the lady of his love appears to have had some resemblance to Dora, the child wife of David Copperfield. And thirdly, that he met her again long years afterwards, when time had worked its changes and the glamour of love had left his eyes, and to that meeting we owe the passages in Little Dorrit relating to poor Flora. This, however, is a parenthesis. The engagement to Miss Hogarth was neither shadowy nor unreal, an engagement only in dreamland. Better for both, perhaps, who knows, if it had been. Ah me, if one could peer into the future, how many weddings there are at which tears would be more appropriate than smiles and laughter? Would Charles Dickens and Catherine Hogarth have forborne to plight their troth, one wonders, if they could have foreseen how slowly and surely the coming years were to sunder their hearts and lives? They were married on the 2nd of April, 1836. This date, again, leads me to a time subsequent to the publication of the first number of Pickwick, which had appeared a day or two before, and again I refrain from dealing with that great book. For before I do so, I wish to pause a brief space to consider what manner of man Charles Dickens was when he suddenly broke on the world in his full popularity, and also what were the influences for good and evil which his early career had exercised upon his character and intellect what manner of man he was. In outward aspect, all accounts agree that he was singularly, noticeably prepossessing, bright, animated, eager, with energy and talent written on every line of his face. Such he was when Forster saw him on the occasion of their first meeting, when Dickens was acting as spokesman for the insurgent reporters engaged on the mirror. So Carlyle, who met him at dinner shortly after this, and was no flatterer, sketches him for us with a pen of unwanted kindliness. Quote, he is a fine little fellow, Boz, I think. Clear, blue, intelligent eyes, eyebrows that he arches amazingly, large, protrusive, rather loose mouth, a face of most extreme mobility, which he shuttles about, eyebrows, eyes, mouth, and all, in a very singular manner while speaking. Surmount this with a loose coil of common-colored hair, and set it on a small, compact figure, very small, and dressed a la d'Orsay rather than well. This is Pickwick. For the rest, a quiet, shrewd-looking little fellow, who seems to guess pretty well what he is and what others are. End of quote. Footnote. Fruits, Thomas Carlyle, A History of His Life in London. End of footnote. Is not this a graphic little picture, and characteristic even to the touch about d'Orsay, the dandy French count, for Dickens, like the young men of the time, Disraeli, Bulwer, and the rest, was a great fop. We, of these degenerate days, shall never see again that antique magnificence in colored velvet waistcoats. But to return. Dickens, it need scarcely be said, 
had by this time long outlived the sickliness of his earlier years. The hardships and trials of his childhood and boyhood had served but to brace his young manhood, knitting the frame and strengthening the nerves. Light and small, as Carlyle describes him, he was wiry and very active, and could bear without injury an amount of intellectual work and bodily fatigue that would have killed many men of seemingly stronger build. And as what might have seemed unfortunate in his youth had helped perchance to develop his physical powers, so had it assisted to strengthen his character and foster his genius. I go back here to the point from which I started. No doubt a weaker man would have been crushed by such a youth. He would have been indolently content to remain a warehouse drudge, would have listlessly fallen into his father's ways about money, would have had no ambition beyond his desk and salary as a lawyer's clerk, would have never cared to piece together and supplement the scattered scraps of his education, would have rested on his oars when he had once shot into the waters of ordinary journalism. With Dickens it was not so. The alchemy of a fine nature had transmuted his disadvantages into gold. To him, the lessons of such a childhood and boyhood as he had had were energy, self-reliance, a determination to overcome all obstacles, to fight the battles of life in all honor and rectitude, so as to win. From the muddle of his father's affairs, he had taken away a lesson of method, order, and punctuality in business and other arrangements. What is worth doing at all is worth doing well, was not only one of his favorite maxims, it was the rule of his life. And for what was to be his life work, what better preparation could there have been than that which he received? I am far from recommending warehouses, squalid solitary lodgings, pawn shops, debtors' prisons, if such could now be found, ill-conducted private schools, which probably could be found, attorneys' offices, and the hand-to-mouth of journalism, as constituting generally the highest ideal of a liberal education. I am equally far from asserting that the majority of men do not require more training of a purely scholastic kind than fell to Dickens' lot. But Dickens was not a bookish man. His genius did not lie in that direction. To have forced him unduly into the world of books would have made him doubtless an average scholar, but might have weakened his hold on life. Such a risk was certainly not worth the running. Fate arranged it otherwise. What he was, above all, was a student of the world of men, a passionately keen observer of the ways of humanity. Men were to be his books, his special branch of knowledge, and in order to graduate and take high honors in that school, I repeat, he could have had no better training. Not only had he passed through a range of most unwanted experiences, experiences calculated to quicken to the uttermost his superb faculties of observation and insight, but he had been placed in sympathetic communication with a strange assortment of characters, lying quite out of the usual ken of the literary classes. Knowledge and sympathy, the seeing eye and the feeling heart, were these nothing to have acquired? That so abnormal an education can have been entirely without drawbacks, it is no part of my purpose to affirm. Tossed, as one may say, to sink or swim amid the waves of life, where those waves ran turbid and brackish, Dickens had emerged strengthened, triumphant, but that some little signs should not remain of the straining and effort with which he had won the land was scarcely to be expected. He himself, in his more confidential communications with Forster, seems to avow a consciousness that this was so. And Forster, though he speaks guardedly, lovingly, appears to be of opinion that a certain self-assertiveness and fierce intolerance of advice or control. Footnote. Quote, I have heard Dickens described by those who knew him, says Mr. Edmund Yates in his recollections, as aggressive, imperious, and intolerant, and I can comprehend the accusation. He was imperious in the sense that his life was conducted on the sic volo sic ubio principle, and that everything gave way before him. The society in which he mixed, the hours which he kept, the opinions which he held, his likes and dislikes, his ideas of what should or should not be, were all settled by himself, not merely for himself, but for all those brought into connection with him, and it was never imagined they could be called in question. He had immense powers of will. End of quote. End of footnote. He himself, in his more confidential communications with Forster, 
seems to avow a consciousness that this was so. And Forrester, though he speaks guardedly, lovingly, appears to be of opinion that a certain self-assertiveness and fierce intolerance of advice or control, occasionally discernible in his friend, might justly be attributed to the harsh influence of early struggles and privations. But what then? That system of education has yet to be devised which shall mold this poor human clay of ours into flawless shapes of use and beauty. A man may be considered fortunate indeed when his training has left in him only what the French call the defects of his virtues, that is, the exaggeration of his good qualities till they turn into faults. Without his immense strength of purpose and iron will, Dickens might never have emerged from obscurity, and the world would have been very distinctly the poorer. One cannot be very sorry that he possessed these gifts in excess. And now, at last, having slightly sketched the history of his earlier years, and endeavored to show, however perfectly, what influences had gone to the formation of his character, I proceed to consider the book that lifted him to fame and fortune. The years of apprenticeship are over, and the master workman brings forth his finished work in its flower of perfection. Let us study Pickwick. End of chapter 2. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter 3 of Life of Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Life of Charles Dickens by Frank Marziales. Chapter 3. Dickens has told us, in his preface to the later editions, much of how Pickwick came to be projected and published. It was in this wise. Seymour, a caricaturist of very considerable merit, though not, as we should now consider, in the first rank of the great caricaturists, had proposed to Messrs. Chapman and Hall, then just starting on their career as publishers, a series of cockney sporting plates. Messrs. Chapman and Hall entertained the idea favorably, but opined that the plates would require illustrative letterpress, and, casting about for some suitable author, bethought themselves of Dickens, whose tales and sketches had been exciting some little sensation in the world of journalism, and who had, indeed, already written for the firm a story the tugs at ramsgate which may be read among the sketches accordingly mr hall called on dickens for the purpose of proposing the scheme this would be in eighteen thirty five towards the latter end of the year and dickens who had apparently left the paternal roof for some little time was living bachelor wise in furnival's inn what was his astonishment when mr hall came in to find he was the same person who had sold him the copy of the magazine containing his first story that memorable copy at which he had looked in Westminster Hall through eyes bedimmed with joyful tears. Such coincidences always had for Dickens a peculiar, almost a superstitious interest. The circumstance seemed of happy augury to both the high contracting parties. Publisher and author were for the nonce on the best of terms. The latter, no doubt, saw his opening, was more than ready to undertake the work, and had no quarrel with the remuneration offered. But even then he was not the man to play second fiddle to anybody. Before they parted, he had quite succeeded in turning the tables on Seymour. The original proposal had been that the artist should produce four caricatures on sporting subjects every month, and that the letterpress should be an illustration of the caricatures. Dickens got Mr. Hall to agree to reverse that position. He, Dickens, was to have the command of the story. The artist was to illustrate him. How far these altered relations would have worked quite smoothly if Seymour had lived, and if Dickens' story had not so soon assumed the proportions of a colossal success, it is idle to speculate. Seymour died by his own hand before the second number was published, and so ceased to be in a position to assert himself. It was, however, in deference to the peculiar bent of his art, that Mr. Winkle, with his disastrous sporting proclivities, made part of the first conception of the book and it is also very significant of the book's origin that the design on the green wrapper in which the monthly parts made their appearance should have had a purely sporting character and exhibited mr pickwick sleepily fishing in a punt and mr winkle shooting at what looks like a cock-sparrow 
the hull surrounded by a chaste arabesque of guns, rods, and landing nets. To Seymour, too, we owe the portrait of Mr. Pickwick, which has impressed that excellent old gentleman's face and figure upon all our memories. But to return to Dickens' interview with Mr. Hall, they seem to have parted in mutual satisfaction. At least it is certain Dickens was satisfied, for in a letter written apparently on the same day to my dearest Kate, he thus sums up the proposals of the publishers. Quote, they have made me an offer of fourteen pounds a month to write and edit a new publication they contemplate, entirely by myself, to be published monthly, and each number to contain four woodcuts. The work will be no joke, but the emolument is too tempting to resist. End of quote. Footnote. See the letters published by Chapman and Hall. End of footnote. So, little thinking how soon he would begin to regard the emolument as ludicrously inadequate, he set to work on Pickwick. The first part was published on the 31st of March, or 1st of April, 1836. That part seems scarcely to have created any sensation. Mr. James Grant, the novelist, says, indeed, that the first five parts were a dead failure, and that the publishers were even debating whether the enterprise had not better be abandoned altogether, when suddenly Sam Weller appeared upon the scene and turned their gloom into laughter. Be that as it may, certain it is that before many months had passed, Messrs. Chapman and Hall must have been thoroughly confirmed in a policy of perseverance. The first order for part one, that is, the first order for binding, was, says the bookbinder who executed the work, for 400 copies only. The order for part 15 had risen to 40,000. All contemporary accounts agree that the success was sudden, immense. The author, like Lord Byron, some 25 years before, awoke and found himself famous. Young as he was, not having yet numbered more than 24 summers, he at one stride reached the topmost height of popularity. Everybody read his book. Everybody laughed over it. Everybody talked about it. Everybody felt, confusedly perhaps, but very surely, that a new and vital force had arisen in English literature. And English literature just then was in one of its times of slackness, rather than full flow. The great tide of the beginning of the century had ebbed. The tide of the Victorian age had scarcely begun to do more than ripple and flash on the horizon. Byron was dead, and Shelley and Keats and Coleridge and Lamb. Southey's life was on the decline. Wordsworth had long executed his best work, while of the coming men, Carlyle, though in the plenitude of his power, having published Sartor Resartus, had not yet published his French Revolution. Footnote. It was finished in January 1837, and not published till six months afterwards. End of footnote. Carlyle, though in the plenitude of his power, having published Sartor Resartus, had not yet published his French Revolution, or delivered his lectures on the heroes, and was not yet in the plenitude of his fame and influence. And Macaulay, then in India, was known only as the essayist and politician. And Lord Tennyson and the Brownings were more or less names of the future. Looking especially at fiction, the time may be said to have been waiting for its master novelist. Five years had gone by since the good and great Sir Walter Scott had been laid to rest in Dryburgh Abbey, there to sleep, as is most fit, among the ruins of that old middle-age world he loved so well, with the babble of the tweed for lullaby. Nor had any one shown himself of stature to step into his vacant place, albeit Bulwer, more precocious even than Dickens, was already known as the author of Pelham, Eugene Aram, and The Last Days of Pompeii, and Disraeli had written Vivian Gray and his earlier books, while Thackeray, Charlotte Bronte, Kingsley, George Eliot, were all, of course, to come later. No, there was a vacant throne among the novelists. Here was the hour, and here, too, was the man. In virtue of natural kingship, he took up his scepter unquestioned. Still, it may not be superfluous to inquire into the why and wherefore of his success. All effects have a cause. What was the cause of this special phenomenon? In the first place, the admirable freshness of the book won its way into every heart. There is a fervor of youth and healthy good spirits about the whole thing. In a former generation, Byron had uttered his wail of despair over a worthless world. We, in our own time, have got back to the dreary point of considering whether life be worth living. 
Here was a writer who had no such misgivings. For him, life was pleasant, useful, full of delight, to be not only tolerated, but enjoyed. He liked its sights, its play of character, its adventures, affected no superiority to its amusements and convivialities, thoroughly laid himself out to please and to be pleased, and his characters were in the same mood. Their fund of animal spirits seemed inexhaustible. For life's jollities they were never unprepared. No doubt there were mighty mean moments in their existence, as there have been in the existence of most of us. It cannot have been pleasant to Mr. Winkle to have his eye blackened by the obstreperous cabman. Mr. Tracy Tupman probably felt a passing pang when jilted by the maiden aunt in favor of the audacious jingle. No man would elect to occupy the position of defendant in an action for breach of promise, or prefer to sojourn in a debtor's prison. But how jauntily do Mr. Pickwick and his friends shake off such discomforts? How buoyantly do they override the billows that beset their course? And what excellent digestions they have, and how slightly do they seem to suffer the next day from any little excesses in the matter of milk punch? Then, besides the good spirits and good temper, there is Dickens' royal gift of humor. As some actors have only to show their face and utter a word or two in order to convulse an audience with merriment, so here does almost every sentence hold good and honest laughter. Not, perhaps, objects the superfine and too dainty critic, humor of the most delicate sort. Not humor that for its rare and exquisite quality can be placed beside the masterpieces in that kind of Lamb or Stern or Goldsmith or Washington Irving. Granted freely, not humor of that special character, but very good humor nevertheless, the thoroughly popular humor of broad comedy and obvious farce, the humor that finds its account where absurd characters are placed in ridiculous situations, that delights in the oddities of the whimsical and eccentric, that irradiates stupidity and makes dullness amusing. How thoroughly wholesome it is, too. To be at the same time merry and wise, says the old adage, is a hard combination. Dickens was both. With all his boisterous merriment, his volleys of inextinguishable laughter, he never makes game of what is at all worthy of respect. Here, as in his later books, right is right and wrong wrong, and he is never tempted to jingle his jester's bell out of season and make right look ridiculous. And if the humor of Pickwick be wholesome, it is also most genial and kindly. We have here no acrid cynic sneeringly pointing out the plague spots of humanity and showing pleasantly how even the good are tainted with evil. Rather does Dickens delight in finding some touch of goodness, some lingering memory of better things, some hopeful aspiration, some trace of unselfish devotion in characters where all seems soddened and lost. In brief, the laughter is the laughter of one who sees the foibles and even the vices of his fellow men, and yet looks on them lovingly and helpfully. So much the first readers of Pickwick might note as the book unfolded itself to them part by part, and they might also note one or two things besides. They might note, they could scarcely fail to do so, that though there was a touch of caricature in nearly all the characters, yet those characters were, one and all, wonderfully real and very much alive. It was no world of shadows to which the author introduced them. Mr. Pickwick had a very distinct existence, and so had his three friends, and Bob Sawyer, and Benjamin Allen, and Mr. Jingle, and Tony Weller, and all the swarm of minor characters. While as to Sam Weller, if it be really true that he averted impending ruin from the book and turned defeat into victory, one can only say that it was like him. When did he ever stint stroke in Fulton Field? By what array of adverse circumstances was he ever taken at a disadvantage? To have created a character of this vitality, of this individual force, would be a feather in the cap of any novelist who ever lived. Something, I think, of Dickens' own blood passed into the special progeniture of his. It has been irreverently said that Falstaff might represent Shakespeare in his cups, just as Hamlet might represent him in his more sober moments. So I have always had a kind of fancy that Sam Weller might be regarded as Dickens himself seen in a certain aspect, a sort of Dickens, shall I say, in a humbler sphere of life, and who had never devoted himself to literature. There is in both the same energy, pluck, essential goodness of heart, fertility of resource, abundance of animal spirits, and also an imagination of a peculiar kind, 
in which wit enters as a main ingredient. And having noted how highly vitalized were the characters in Pickwick, I think the first readers might also fairly be expected to note, and in fact it is clear from Dickens' preface that they did note, how greatly the book increased in scope and power as it proceeded. The beginning was conceived almost in a spirit of farce. The incidents and adventures had scarcely any other object than to create amusement. Mr. Pickwick himself appeared on the scene with fantastic honors and the badge of absurdity, as, quote, the man who had traced to their source the mighty ponds of Hampstead and agitated the scientific world with a theory of tittlebats, end of quote. But in all this, there is a gradual change. Mr. Pickwick is presented to us latterly as an exceedingly sound-headed as well as sound-hearted old gentleman, whom we should never think of associating with the sources of Hampstead Ponds or any other folly. While in such scenes as those at the Fleet Prison, the author is clearly endeavoring to do much more than raise a laugh. He is sounding the deeper, more tragic chords in human feeling. Ah, if we add to all this, to the freshness, the go, the good spirits, the keen observation, the graphic painting, the humor, the vitality of the characters, the gradual development of power, if we add to all this that something which is in all and greater than all, viz. genius, and genius of a highly popular kind, then we shall have no difficulty in understanding why everybody read Pickwick, and how it came to pass that its publishers made some twenty thousand pounds by a work they had once thought of abandoning as worthless. Footnote. They acknowledged to Dickens that they had made fourteen thousand pounds by the sale of the monthly parts alone. End of footnote. End of chapter three. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter Four of Life of Charles Dickens by Frank Marziales. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Dickens was not at all the man to rest on his oars while Pickwick was giving such a magnificent impetus to the boat that contained his fortunes. The amount of work which he accomplished in the years 1836, 1837, 1838, and 1839 is, if we consider its quality, amazing. Pickwick, as we have seen, was begun with the first of these years, and its publication continued till the November of 1837. Independently of his work on Pickwick, he was, in the year 1836, engaged in the arduous profession of a reporter till the close of the parliamentary session, and also wrote a pamphlet on Sabbatarianism, a farce in two acts, The Strange Gentleman for the St. James Theatre, and a comic opera, The Village Coquettes, which was set to music by Hola. With the very commencement of 1837, Pickwick, it will be remembered, going on all the while, he entered upon the duties of editor of Bentley's Miscellany, and in the second number began the publication of Oliver Twist, which was continued into the early months of 1839, when his connection with the magazine ceased. In the April of 1838, and simultaneously, of course, with Oliver Twist, appeared the first part of Nicholas Nickleby, the last part appearing in the October of the following year. Three novels of more than full size and of first-rate importance in less than four years, besides a good deal of other miscellaneous work. Certainly that was good going. The pace was decidedly fast. Small wonder that the quarterly review, even so early as October 1837, was tempted to croak about Mr. Dickens as writing, quote, too often and too fast, and putting forth in their crude, unfinished, undigested state, thoughts, feelings, observations, and plans, which it required time and study to mature, and to warn him that as he has risen like a rocket, so he was in danger of coming down like the stick." Unquote. Small wonder, I say, and yet to us now how unjust the accusation appears, and how false the prophecy. Rapidly as those books were executed, Dickens, like the real artist that he was, had put into them his best work. There was no scamping. The critics of the time judged superficially, not making allowance for the ample fund of observations he had amassed, for the genuine fecundity of his genius, and for the admirable industry of an extremely industrious man. The world's workers, there exists under that general designation a series of short biographies, for which Miss Dickens has written a sketch of her father's life. To no one could the description more fittingly apply. Throughout his life he worked desperately hard. He possessed, in a high degree, the, quote, infinite faculty for taking pains, unquote, 
which is so great an adjunct to genius, though it is not, as the good Sir Joshua Reynolds held, genius itself. Thus, what he had done rapidly was done well, and for the rest, the writer who had yet to give the world, Martin Chuzzlewit, The Christmas Carol, David Copperfield, and Dombey, was not coming down like a stick. There were many more stars and of very brilliant colors to be showered out by that rocket, and the stick has not even yet fallen to the ground. Footnote. I think critics, and perhaps I myself, have been a little hard on this quarterly reviewer. He did not, after all, say that Dickens would come down like a stick, only that he might do so if he wrote too fast and furiously. End of footnote. Naturally, with the success of Pickwick came a great change in Dickens' pecuniary position. He had, as we have seen, been glad enough, before he began the book, to close with the offer of fourteen pounds for each monthly part. That sum was afterwards increased to fifteen pounds, and the first two payments seemed to have been made in advance, for the purpose of helping him to defray the expenses of his marriage. But as the sale leapt up, the publishers themselves felt that such a rate of remuneration was altogether insufficient, and sent him, first and last, a goodly number of supplementary checks, for sums amounting in the aggregate, as they computed, to three thousand pounds, and as Forster computes, to about twenty-five hundred pounds. This Dickens, who, to use his own words, quote, never undervalued his own work, unquote, considered a very inadequate percentage on their gains, forgetting a little, perhaps, that the risks had been wholly theirs, and that he had been more than content with the original bargain. Similarly, he was soon utterly dissatisfied with his arrangements with Bentley, about the editorship of the Miscellany and Oliver Twist, arrangements which had been entered into in August 1836 while Pickwick was in progress, and he utterly refused to let that publisher have Gabriel Varden, the locksmith of London, Barnaby Rudge, on the terms originally agreed upon. With Macrone also, who had made some £4,000 by the sketches and given him about £400, he was no better pleased, especially when that enterprising gentleman threatened a reissue in monthly parts, and so compelled him to repurchase the copyright for £2,000. But, however much he might consider himself ill-treated by the publishing fraternity, he was, of course, rapidly getting far richer than he had been, and so able to enlarge his mode of life. He had begun, modestly enough, by taking his wife to live with him in his bachelor's quarters in Furnival's Inn much as Tommy Traddles and David Copperfield took his wife to live in chambers at Gray's Inn. And there, in Furnival's Inn, his first child, a boy, was born on the 6th of January, 1837. But in the March of that year he moved to a more commodious dwelling at 48 Doty Street, where he remained till the end of 1839, when still increasing means enabled him to move to a still better house at 1 Devonshire Terrace, Regent's Park. But the house in Doty Street must have been endeared to him by many memories. It was there, on the 7th of May, 1837, that he lost, at the early age of 17 and quite suddenly, a sister-in-law, Mary Hogarth, to whom he was greatly attached. The blow fell so heavily at the time as to incapacitate him from all work and delayed the publication of one of the numbers of Pickwick. Nor was the sorrow only sharp and transient. He speaks of her in the preface to the first edition of that book. Her spirit seemed to be hovering near as he stood looking at Niagara. He felt her hallowing influence when in danger of growing too much elated by his first reception in America. She came back to him in dreams in Italy. Her image remained in his heart, unchanged by time, as he declared, to the very end. She represented to his mind all that was pure and lovely in opening womanhood, and lives in the world created by his art as the little knell of the old curiosity shop. It was in Doty Street, too, that he began to gather round him the circle of friends whose names seem almost like a muster roll of the famous men and women in the first thirty years of Queen Victoria's reign. I shall not enumerate them. The list of writers, artists, actors would be too long. But this, at least, it would be unjust not to note, that among his friends were included nearly all those who, by any stretch of fancy, could be regarded as his rivals in the fields of humor and fiction with Washington Irving, Hood, Douglas Gerald, Lord Lytton, Harrison Ainsworth, Mr. Wilkie Collins, Mrs. Gaskell, and, save for a passing foolish quarrel with Thackeray, the novelist who really was his peer, he maintained the kindliest and most cordial relations. Nor when George Eliot published her first books, 
the scenes of clerical life, and Adam Bede, did anyone acknowledge their excellence more freely. Petty jealousies found no place in the nature of this great writer. It was also while living at Doty Street that he seems, in great measure, to have formed those habits of work and relaxation which every artist fashions so as to suit his own special needs and idiosyncrasies. His favorite time for work was the morning, between the hours of breakfast and lunch, and though at this particular period the enormous pressure of his engagements compelled him to work double tides and often far into the night, yet he was essentially a day worker, not a night worker. Like the great German poet Goethe, he preferred to exercise his art in the fresh morning hours, when the dewdrops, as it were, lay bright upon his imagination and fancy, and for relaxation and sedative, when he had thoroughly worn himself out with mental toil, he would have recourse to the hardest bodily exercise. At first, riding seems to have contented him, fifteen miles out and fifteen miles in, with a halt at some roadside inn for refreshment. But soon walking took the place of riding, and he became an indefatigable pedestrian. He would think nothing of a walk of twenty or thirty miles, and that not merely in the vigorous heyday of youth, but afterwards to the very last. He was always on those alert quick feet of his, perambulating London from end to end and in every direction, perambulating the suburbs, perambulating the greater London that lies within a radius of twenty miles, round the central core of metropolitan houses. In short, he was everywhere, in all weathers, at all hours. Nor was London, smaller and greater, his only walking field. He would walk wherever he was, walked through and through Genoa and all about Genoa when he lived there, knew every inch of the Kent country round Broadstairs and round Gad's Hill, was, as I have said, always, always, always on his feet. But if he would pedestrianize everywhere, London remained the walking ground of his heart. As Dr. Johnson held that nothing equaled a stroll down Fleet Street, so did Dickens, sitting in full view of Genoa's perfect bay, and with the blue Mediterranean sparkling at his feet, turn in thought for inspiration to his old haunts. Quote, never, he writes to Forrester when about to begin the chimes, never did I stagger so upon a threshold before. I seem as if I had plucked myself out of my proper soil when I left Devonshire Terrace and could take root no more until I returned to it. Did I tell you how many fountains we have here? No matter. If they played nectar, they wouldn't please me half so well as the West Middlesex Waterworks at Devonshire Terrace. Put me down on Waterloo Bridge at eight o'clock in the evening, with leave to roam about as long as I like, and I would come home, as you know, panting to go on. I am sadly strange as it is, and can't settle. End of quote. Eight o'clock in the evening, that points to another of his peculiarities. As he liked best to walk in London, so he liked best to walk at night. The darkness of the great city had a strange fascination for him. He never grew tired of it, would find pleasure and refreshment when most weary and jaded in losing himself in it, in abandoning himself to its mysteries. Looked at with this knowledge, the opening of The Old Curiosity Shop becomes a passage of autobiography and how all those wanderings must have served him in his art. Remember what a keen observer he was, perhaps one of the keenest that ever lived, and then think what food for observation he would thus be constantly collecting. To the eye that knows how to see, there is no stage where so many scenes from the drama of life are being always enacted as the streets of London. Dickens frequented that theater very assiduously, and of his power of sight there can be no question. End of chapter 4 Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter 5 of Life of Charles Dickens by Frank Marziales. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Pickwick had been a novel without any plot. The story, if story it can be called, bore every trace of its hasty origin. Scene succeeded scene, and incident incident, and Mr. Pickwick and his three friends were hurried about from place to place and through adventures of all kinds without any particularly defined purpose. In truth, many people, and myself among the number, find some difficulty in reading the book as a connected narrative, and prefer to take it piecemeal. But in Oliver Twist there is a serious effort to work out a coherent plot and real unity of conception. Whether that conception be based on probability is another point.
Oliver is the illegitimate son of a young lady who has lapsed from virtue under circumstances of great temptation, but still lapsed from virtue, and who dies in giving him birth. He is brought up as a pauper child in a particularly ill-managed workhouse and apprenticed to a low undertaker. Thence he escapes and walks to London, where he falls in with a gang of thieves. His legitimate brother, an unutterable scoundrel, happens to see him in London, and, recognizing him by a likeness to their common father, bribes the thieves to recapture him when he has escaped from their clutches. Now I would rather not say whether I consider it quite likely that a boy of this birth and nurture would fly at a boy much bigger than himself in vindication of the fair fame of a mother whom he had never known, or would freely risk his life to warn a sleeping household that they were being robbed, or would on all occasions exhibit the most excellent manners and morals and a delicacy of feeling that is quite dainty. But this is the essence of the book, to show purity and goodness of disposition as self-sufficient in themselves to resist all adverse influences is Dickens' main object. Take Oliver's sweet, uncontaminated character away, and the story crumbles to pieces. With mere improbabilities of plot, I have no quarrel. Of course, it is not likely that the boy, on the occasion of his first escape from the thieves, should be rescued by his father's oldest friend, and on the second occasion come across his aunt. But such coincidences must be accepted in any story. They violate no truth of character. I'm afraid I can't say as much of Master Oliver's graces and virtues. With this reservation, however, how much there is in the book to which unstinted admiration can be given. As Pickwick first fully exhibited the humorous side of Dickens' genius, so Oliver Twist first fully exhibited its tragic side. The pathetic side was to come somewhat later. The scenes at the workhouse, at the thieves' dens in London, the burglary, the murder of poor Nancy, the escape and death of the horror-haunted Sykes, all are painted with a master's hand. And the book, like its predecessor, and like those that were to follow, contains characters that have passed into common knowledge as types, characters of the keenest individuality, and that yet seem in themselves to sum up a whole class. Such are Bill Sykes, whose ruffianism has an almost epic grandeur, and black-hearted Fagin the Jew, receiver of stolen goods and trainer of youth in the way they should not go, and Master Dawkins, the artful dodger. Such, too, is Mr. Bumble, greatest and most unhappy of Beatles. Comedy had predominated in Pickwick, tragedy in Oliver Twist. The more complete fusion of the two was effected in Nicholas Nickleby. But as the mighty actor Garrick, in the well-known picture by Sir Joshua Reynolds, is drawn toward the more mirthful of the two sisters, so, here again, I think that comedy decidedly bears away the palm, though tragedy is not beaten altogether without a struggle either. Here is the story as it unfolds itself. The two heroes are Ralph Nickleby and his nephew Nicholas. They stand forth almost from the beginning as antagonists, in battle array the one against the other, and the story is, in the main, a history of the campaigns between them, cunning and greed being mustered on the one side, and young, generous courage on the other. At first, Nicholas believes in his uncle, who promises to befriend Nicholas's mother and sister, and obtains for Nicholas himself a situation as usher in a Yorkshire school kept by one Squeers. But the young fellow's gorge rises at the sickening cruelty exercised in the school, and he leaves it, having first beaten Mr. Squeers, leaves it followed by a poor shattered creature called Smike. Meanwhile, Ralph, the usurer, befriends his sister-in-law and niece after his own fashion, and tries to use the latter's beauty in furtherance of his trade as a moneylender. Nicholas discovers his plots, frustrates all his schemes, rescues and ultimately marries a young lady who had been enmeshed in one of them, and Ralph at last, utterly beaten, commits suicide on finding that Smike, through whom he had been endeavouring all through to injure Nicholas, and who is now dead, was his own son. Such are the book's dry bones, its skeleton, which one is almost ashamed to expose thus nakedly. For the beauty of these novels lies not at all in the plot, it is in the incidents, situations, characters. And with beauty of this kind, how richly dowered is Nicholas Nickleby. Take the characters alone. What lavish profusion of humor in the theatrical group that clusters around Mr. Vincent Crummles, the country manager, and in the Squeers family, too, and in the little shop world of Mrs. Mantellini, the fashionable dressmaker, 
and incurable brothers, the golden-hearted old merchants who take Nicholas into their counting-house. Then, for single characters, commend me to Mrs. Nickleby, whose logic, which some cynics would call feminine, is positively sublime in its want of coherence, and to John Browdie, the honest Yorkshire corn factor, as good a fellow almost as Dandy Dinmont, the border yeoman whom Scott made immortal. The high-life personages are far less successful. Dickens had small gift that way, and seldom succeeded in his society pictures. Nor, if the truth must be told, do I greatly care for the description of the duel between Sir Mulberry Hawk and Lord Verisoft, though it was evidently much admired at the time, and is quoted as a favorable specimen of Dickens' style in Charles Knight's Half Hours with the Best Authors. The writing is a little too tall. It lacks simplicity, as is sometimes the case with Dickens, when he wants to be particularly impressive. And this leads me, by a kind of natural sequence, to what I have to say about his next book, The Old Curiosity Shop. For here again, though in a very much more marked degree, I fear I shall have to run counter to a popular opinion. But first a word as to the circumstances under which the book was published. Casting about, after the conclusion of Nicholas Nickleby, for further literary ventures, Dickens came to the conclusion that the public must be getting tired of his stories in monthly parts. It occurred to him that a weekly periodical, somewhat after the manner of Addison's Spectator, or Goldsmith's Bee, and containing essays, stories, and miscellaneous papers, to be written mainly but not entirely by himself, would be just the thing to revive interest and give his popularity a spur. Accordingly, an arrangement was entered into with Messrs. Chapman and Hall, by which they covenanted to give him fifty pounds for each weekly number of such a periodical, and half profits, and the first number of Master Humphrey's Clock made its appearance in the April of 1840. Unfortunately, Dickens had reckoned altogether without his host. The public were not to be cajoled. What they expected from their favorite was novels, not essays, short stories, or sketches, however admirable. The orders for the first number had amounted to 70,000, but they fell off as soon as it was discovered that Master Humphrey, sitting by his clock, had no intention of beguiling the world with a continuous narrative, that the title, in short, did not stand for the title of a novel. Either the times were not ripe for the household words, which ten years afterwards proved to be such a great and permanent success, or Dickens had laid his plans badly. Vainly did he put forth all his powers, vainly did he bring back upon the stage those old popular favorites, Mr. Pickwick, Sam Weller, and Tony Weller. All was of no avail. Clearly, in order to avoid defeat, a change of front had become necessary. The novel of The Old Curiosity Shop was accordingly commenced in the fourth number of the clock, and very soon acted the cuckoo's part of thrusting Master Humphrey and all that belonged to him out of the nest. He disappeared pretty well from the periodical, and when the novel was republished, the whole machinery of the clock had gone, and with it, I may add, some very characteristic and admirable writing. Dickens himself confessed that he, quote, winced a little when the opening paper, in which Master Humphrey described himself and his manner of life, became the property of the trunk maker and the butterman, end quote. And most Dickens lovers will agree with me in rejoicing that the omitted parts have now at last been tardily rescued from unmerited neglect, and finds a place in the recently issued Charles Dickens edition of the works. There is no hero in The Old Curiosity Shop, unless Mr. Richard Swiveller, perpetual grandmaster of the glorious Apollos, be the questionable hero. And the heroine is little Nell, a child. Of Dickens' singular feeling for the pathos and humor of childhood I have already spoken. Many novelists, perhaps one might even say most novelists, have no freedom of utterance when they come to speak about children, do not know what to do with a child if it chances to stray into their pages. But how different with Dickens. He is never more thoroughly at home than with the little folk. Perhaps his best speech, and they are all good, is the one uttered at the dinner given on behalf of the children's hospital. Certainly, there is no figure in Dombey and Son on which more loving care has been lavished than the figure of little Paul, and when the lad dies one quite feels that the light has gone out of the book. David Copperfield, shorn of David's childhood and youth, would be a far less admirable performance. The hero of Oliver Twist is a boy. Pip is a boy through a fair portion of great expectations. The heroine of the old curiosity shop is, as I have just said, a girl, 
and of all these children the one who seems from the first to have stood highest in popular favor and won most hearts is little nell i me what tears have been shed over her weary wanderings with that absurd old gambling grandfather of hers how many persons have sorrowed over her untimely end as if she had been a daughter or a sister high and low literate and illiterate over nearly all has she cast her spell hood he who sang the song of the shirt paid her tribute of his admiration and geoffrey the hard-headed old judge and editor of the edinburgh review the tribute of his tears landor volleyed forth his thunderous praises over her grave likening her to juliet and desdemona nay dickens himself sadly bewailed her fate described himself as being the wretchedest of the wretched when it drew near and shut himself from all society as if he had suffered a real bereavement while as to the feeling which she is excited in the breasts of the illiterate we may take mr bret hart's account of the haggard gold diggers by the roaring californian campfire who throw down their cards to listen to her story and for the nonce are softened and humanized footnote dickens in camp end of footnote such is the sympathy she has created and for the description of her death and burial as a superb piece of pathetic writing there has been a perfect chorus of praise broken here and there no doubt by a discordant voice but still of the loudest and most heartfelt did not horn a poet better known to the last generation than to this point out that though printed as prose these passages were perhaps as quote, the result of harmonious accident unquote, essentially poetry and quote, written in blank verse of irregular meters and rhythms which southey and shelley and some other poets have occasionally adopted End of quote. did he not print part of the passages in this form substituting only as a concession to the conventionalities of verse the word grand dames for grandmothers and did he not declare of one of the extracts so printed that it was quote, worthy of the best passages in wordsworth End of quote. if it argues an insensibility to stand somewhat unmoved among all these tears and admiration i am afraid i must be rather pebble-hearted to tell the whole damaging truth i am and always have been only slightly affected by the story of little nell have never felt any particular inclination to shed a tear over it and consider the closing chapters as failing of their due effect on me at least because they are pitched in a key that is altogether too high and unnatural of course one makes a confession of this kind with diffidence it is no light thing to stem the current of a popular opinion but one can only go with the stream when one thinks the stream is flowing in a right channel and here i think the stream is meandering out of its course for me little nell is scarcely more than a figure in cloudland possibly part of the reason why i do not feel as much sympathy with her as i ought is because i do not seem to know her very well with paul dombey i am intimately acquainted i should recognize the child anywhere should be on the best of terms with him in five minutes few things would give me greater pleasure than an hour saunter by the side of his little invalid's carriage along the parade at brighton how we should laugh to be sure if we happened to come across mr toots and smile too if we met feeder b a and give a furtive glance of recognition at glubb the discarded charioteer then the classic cornelia blimber would pass on her constitutional and we should quail a little at least i am certain i should as she bent upon us her scholastic spectacles and a glimpse of dr blimber would chill us even more till ah what's this why does a flush of happiness mantle over my little friend's pale face why does he utter a faint cry of pleasure yes there she is he has caught sight of floy running forward to meet him so am i led almost instinctively whenever the figure of paul flashes into my mind to think of him as a child i have actually known but now she has no such reality of existence she has been etherealized vaporized rhapsodized about till the flesh and blood have gone out of her i recognize her attributes unselfishness sweetness of disposition gentleness but these don't constitute a human being they don't make up a recognizable individuality if i met her in the street i am afraid i should not know her and if i did i am sure we should both find it difficult to keep up a conversation do the passages describing her death and burial really possess the rhythm of poetry that would seem to me i confess to be as ill a compliment as to say of a piece of poetry that it was really prose the music of prose and poetry are essentially different they do not affect the ear in the same way the one is akin to song the other to speech give to prose the recurring cadences 
the measure, and the rhythmic march of verse, and it becomes bad prose without becoming good poetry. Footnote. Dickens himself knew that he had a tendency to fall into blank verse in moments of excitement and tried to guard against it. End of footnote. So, in fairness to Dickens, one is bound, as far as one can, to forget Horne's misapplied praise. But even thus, and looking upon it as prose alone, can we say that the account of Nell's funeral is, in the high artistic sense, a piece of good work? Here is an extract. Quote, and now the bell, the bell she had so often heard, by night and day, and listened to with solemn pleasure almost as a living voice, rang its remorseless toll for her, so young, so beautiful, so good. Decrepit age, and vigorous life, and blooming youth, and helpless infancy, poured forth, on crutches, in the pride of strength and health, in the full blush of promise, in the mere dawn of life, to gather round her tomb. Old men were there, whose eyes were dim and senses failing, grandmothers who might have died ten years ago and still been old, the deaf, the blind, the lame, the palsied, the living dead in many shapes and forms, to see the closing of that earthly grave. What was the death it would shut in to that which still could crawl and creep above it? End of quote. Such is the tone throughout, and one feels inclined to ask whether it is quite the appropriate tone in which to speak of the funeral of a child in a country churchyard. All this pomp of rhetoric seems to me, shall I say it, as much out of place as if Nell had been buried like some great soldier or minister of state, with a hearse, all sable velvet and nodding plumes, drawn by a long train of sable steeds and a final discharge of artillery over the grave. The verbal honors paid here to the deceased are really not much less incongruous and out of keeping. Surely, in such a subject, above all others, the pathos of simplicity would have been most effective. There are some, indeed, who deny to Dickens the gift of pathos altogether. Such persons acknowledge, for the most part a little unwillingly, that he was a master of humor of the broader, more obvious kind. But they assert that all his sentiment is mawkish and overstrained, and that his efforts to compel our tears are so obvious as to defeat their own purpose. Now it will be clear, from what I have said about Little Nell, that I am capable of appreciating the force of any criticism of this kind. Nay, that I go so far as to acknowledge that Dickens occasionally lays himself open to it. But go one inch beyond this I cannot. Of course we may, if we like, take up a position of pure stoicism and deny pathos altogether in life as in art. We may regard all human affairs as but a mere struggle for existence, and say that might makes right, and that the weak is only treated according to his deserts when he goes to the wall. We may hold that neither sorrow nor suffering call for any meed of sympathy. Such is mainly the attitude which the French novelist adopts towards the world of his creation. Footnote. Monsieur Daudet, in many respects a follower of Dickens, is a fine and notable exception. End of footnote. But once admit that feeling is legitimate, once allow that tears are due to those who have been crushed and left bleeding by this great world of ours as it crashes blundering on its way, once grant that the writer's art can properly embrace what Shakespeare calls the pity of it, the sorrows inwoven in all our human relationships, once acknowledge all this, and then I affirm most confidently that Dickens, working at his best, was one of the greatest masters of pathos who ever lived. I can myself see scarce a strained discordant note in the account of the short life and early death of Paul Dombey, and none in the description of the death of Paul Dombey's mother, or in the story of Tiny Tim, or in the record of David Copperfield's childhood and boyhood. I consider the passage in American Notes describing the traits of gentle kindliness among the emigrants as being nobly, pathetically eloquent. Did space allow, I could support my position by quotations and examples to any extent. And my conclusion is that, though he failed with little Nell, yet he succeeded elsewhere, and superbly. The number of Master Humphrey's clock containing the conclusion of the old curiosity shop appeared on the 17th of January, 1841, and Barnaby Rudge began its course in the ensuing week. The first had it been essentially a tale of modern life. All the characters that made a kind of background, mostly grotesque or hideous, for the figure of Little Nell, were characters of today, or at least of the day when the book was written, for I must not forget that that day ran into the past some six and forty years ago. Quilp the Dwarf, and a far finer specimen of a scoundrel, by the by, in every respect, than that poor stage villain Monks. Samson Brass and his legal sister Sally, a goodly pair, 
Kit, golden-hearted and plain of body, who so barely escapes from the plot laid by the aforementioned worthies to prove him a thief. Chuckster, most lady-killing of notary's clerks. Mrs. Jarley, the good-natured waxwork woman, in whose soul there would be naught save kindliness, only she cannot bring herself to tolerate Punch and Judy. Short and Codlin, the Punch and Judy men, the little misused servant whom Dick Swiveller in his grandeur creates a marchioness, and the magnificent Swiveller himself, prince among the idle and impecunious, justifying by his snatches of song and flowery rhetoric his high position as perpetual grandmaster among the glorious Apollers. All these, making allowance perhaps for some idealization, were personages of Dickens' own time. But in Barnaby Rudge, Dickens threw himself back into the last century. The book is a historical novel, one of the two which he wrote, the other being The Tale of Two Cities, and its scenes are many of them laid among the no-popery riots of 1780. A ghastly time, a time of aimless, brutal incendiarism and mad turbulence on the part of the mob a time of weakness and ineptitude on the part of the government, a time of wickedness, folly, and misrule. Dickens describes it admirably. His picture of the riots themselves seem painted in pigments of blood and fire, and yet, through all the hurry and confusion, he retains the clearness of arrangement and lucidity which characterize the pictures of such subjects when executed by the great masters of the art, as Carlyle, for example. His portrait of the poor, crazy-brained creature, Lord George Gordon, who sowed the wind which the country was to reap in whirlwind, is excellent. Nor is what may be called the private part of the story unskillfully woven with the historical part. The plot, though not good, rises perhaps above the average of Dickens' plots, for even we, his admirers, are scarcely bound to maintain that plot was his strong point. Beyond this, I think I may say that the book is, on the whole, the least characteristic of his books. It is the one which those who are most out of sympathy with his peculiar vein of humor and pathos will probably think the best, and the one which the true Dickens lovers will generally regard as bearing the greatest resemblance to an ordinary novel. End of chapter 5. Recording by Colleen McMahon.